Okay. Um, hi, everyone. How are you today? So, um, I am the only presenter in person, but I'm joined by three other um, presenters virtually. Um, and we're going to do a panel. So, I'm going to be playing two hats today. I'm going to be the moderator and kind of uh, give examples. So, um, but at the end, if you have questions, feel free. Um, we want this to be interactive, but because we have so much information and we want to share our stories, we ask that you um, ask questions at the end. So um, our title of the presentation is The LGBTQ Perspective on Healthcare and Relationships Beyond High School. So um, we can go to the next slide. So like I said, I am joined um, me, Christy Carter, I use she, her, hers. Um, I'm the Aging and Disability Program Coordinator at the Milwaukee LGBT Center. And I'm joined by my um, colleague, Brooke. Um, they use they, them, theirs. Blue, they use they, them, theirs. And J James Hoss, or JC, and he uses he, him, his. So, hi, guys. I'm excited to do this with you today, like I said uh, uh, yesterday. So... Hi. Okay. Uh, next slide. Oops. So I'm gonna go over. Um. Oops. Let's see. I'm gonna go over some of the terms. So um, I did this a little bit um in my presentation last year, but we're just gonna go um over some general terms. Oops. Are we good? Okay. Um. So the L and LGBT stands for uh oh. Okay. Okay. So, um, like I said, I'm gonna go over a little bit of terminology really quick, and then we're gonna be talking, um, and going into the panel. But the L, um, and LGBT stands for someone who experiences romantic and/or um, sexual or physical attraction to people um of the same gender, which with folks that are lesbian, it's folks that are um, like female, um, and with folks that are gay, it's folks that are male. So, um, and then the B um, is someone who is bisexual or someone who experiences romantic and or emotional attraction to people of um, both the same or opposite sex. Um, and then, uh, Transgender is someone whose gender identity does not match their sex assigned at birth. So I always say um, that I identify as a um, woman um, and my sex assigned at birth was female. So I, I don't identify as transgender, but someone who identifies as transgender, they, when the doctor, when the, when the child was born and the doctor looked between the child's legs, they're like, oh, a boy, or, oh, a girl. And maybe they, when they um, grew up or went to school, they realized that their, well, how they identified when they were born didn't match. And those, so those folks are transgender. And then um, queer. So it's queer is an umbrella term. It can be um, used to talk about people um, on the spectrum of LGBTQ. Um, usually, uh, queer when, for young folks is used as kind of an affirming term, um, but when you use queer, uh, when you're talking about adults or older adults, th that might be seen as um, a negative term um, and cause a lot of harm, um, kind of like the, um, like, the term um, like clip, like if my people that I'm friends with will say, oh, we're like clip, we kind of took back that word. But if someone else, like if someone else that didn't have a disability said that to me, I would look at them and be like, that's not appropriate. That's negative and I don't appreciate that you said that. Um, so those are the terms, but now we're gonna get to the fun part. So. Next slide. 
Okay, so we are gonna start with this video. And if it doesn't work on the PowerPoint, then there's a link you should have. I think other people can be really supportive in being there, being a presence, say, hey, if you need to talk about it, I'm here. I think it's on, I think it's asking, not assuming that you know what the person needs or wants. So I'd really like to support you in this, is, you know, what, what, what would be helpful, what can I do? The most obvious thing is just listen and don't be a d I don't think it's a bad thing to offer help. I think it's a really good thing, but you have to be ready. I think other people can be really supportive in being there, being a presence, say, hey, if you need to talk about it, I'm here. I think it's on, I think it's asking, not assuming that you know what the person needs or wants. So I'd really like to support you in this, is, you know, what, what, what would be helpful, what can I do? The most obvious thing is just listen and don't be a d I don't think it's a bad thing to offer help. I think it's a really good thing, but you have to be ready for the answer to be no. And you have to wait for the answer first. And then you have to actually listen to the answer. And then, like, if someone's fine, just be like, okay, and back the f off. And if they're not fine, then ask them what they need. Don't just, like, grab at their handles and, like, tip them out of the chair like a wheelbarrow, because that's just, oh, it's um, happened too many times. If I meet you for the first time, I'm out to say, I'll to tell up there, and so if you can't understand me, or vice versa, just be extra patient, or ask to repeat yourself. And vice versa, uh, it's quite different. I find with some people, they be more sensitive in that they might see me as, no, I understand what's going on. They, they kind of step in, they go, okay, I'll repeat what's going on there, uh, which is very helpful of them, because I don't ask them to do that, and I kind of don't want to put that onto them, even though that we might. Listen to the lived experience of the person. Encourage them to connect to community, because that's actually going, like peer support is actually going to be the thing that keeps that person feeling okay. But yeah, I think reading the room for me is just the, the first and the, like, the biggest thing. Like, sometimes I don't want to talk about it. Sometimes, through people's best intentions, they'll send me content on it. The unsolicited information bit can like or like unsolicited conversation can be a bit annoying sometimes if I'm like having a nice day not thinking about it not wanting to think about it and it just derails you because like oh that's right I have this thing that everyone can see. Lol. Oh the queer community is not accessible. <laughs> it wishes it was. That's changing. I think there's a lot of improvements happening in a lot of spaces. We're seeing more events being Auslan interpreted. We're seeing more events have wheelchair access and wheelchair access that's not just like the door not having steps it's like there is a bathroom can I pee will I have to just dehydrate for the entire evening which is not fun and you don't want to do that and you will get a UTI. I mean, obviously in the deaf community there's a range of gay strength and whatever a party for the deaf gay person it's easy to because they know what the access requirements are and they provide accessible requirements in terms of interpreting or closed captioning services. I've been very fortunate that I've never experienced transphobia with a service provider. I feel really blessed because my current service provider's taking me like business attire shopping on Monday. That kind of broke me heart. I went and had a little happy tear for a change when I left. They were just so supportive. There's still a way to go in the general community as well as the LGBTIQ community. I feel like I'm really fortunate in terms of the social circles and the bases that I move in. Disability is very well regarded and people's needs are respected and considered. In terms of going out to venues and things like that, a lot of venues probably don't deal with disability anywhere near as well as they should. I think there's a lot of community education that needs to happen, not, not really just so much in the community, but the structures around it. So things like security guards accessing a venue, cerebral palsy affects the way I walk, and it's often hard for me to get a cab home on the weekends because people think I'm drunk. It's not just the fact that a lot of events are inaccessible, it's that they don't say it on the event. So I feel like I'm constantly in this position of having to ask and then have people get defensive about it. And I'm like, I'm not trying to start a fight. I just want to know if I can go to the party. I'm noticing that in the last five years, there seems to be a huge shift generally in mainstream and probably queer cultures as well. Just more of an awareness that there's a wide spectrum of people with physical and mental disabilities that might have specific needs that need accommodating. So I do think it's changing. That's the end of it. Um, so 40% of people that are LGBT identify as also having a disability, 
Um, and the folks that join me. Um, There's one simple hearing hack anyone can use to improve. The folks that have joined me on this panel are part of the disability support group that I run at the center. Um, so um, we, are, we all have lived experiences with disability and we all identify as LGBT. So, um, but not from the video. We just thought that that was um, important to share with y'all kind of to give you a little background. But that was from Australia, the video. Okay. We can go to the next slide. So our first um, batch of questions, we're gonna talk about post high school opportunities. Um, and JC, you're gonna take this, you're gonna start with this one, correct? Yep. Um, so I was really nervous uh, coming into uh, the, this post high school time. I had a lot of struggles in, in, in high school and uh, I, I, based on what I, thought I knew about post high school education and, and jobs, I, I was not really looking forward to it. Um, but as I found, as, as we'll share in these next few slides here, uh, there are a lot of ways that, that college and post-secondary education and, and trade education uh, and other programs available can really uh, open doors for you. Uh, they can expand what, you, what your opportunities are, that you meet new people and do other things. Uh, so can we get the next slide, please? So some specific ways that college and post-secondary education may open doors is that you can choose your target, choose something that you're really interested in, uh, choose your environment of how any type of learning or participation is, is managed and delivered, choose what you're focusing on, choose your pace. Uh, there's a lot of you know, flexibility, options, autonomy to, to build your own pathways that are not really present uh, in, in K-12. And there's also a ton of opportunities to, to meet people and, and get involved in, in things that matter to you. Uh, so, so even if, if, if high school uh, wasn't something you liked, uh, if, you, if you struggled with it, education uh, can, can still be a, a valuable option. Next slide, please. Uh, so some specific things that I'd like to highlight um, in, in looking at post high school learning opportunities, there's really a whole universe of options that, that have developed over the past uh, decade or two here. Uh, in, in terms of classes, of course, there's in-person classes, kind of like what you might be familiar with in a high school environment, uh, but there's also a tremendous world of online learning today. Uh, and with online learning, you can do a, a live synchronous environment, like you're, you're participating in a class in real time. Um, but there's also a way to do asynchronous where you're, you're given the work and, and, and the videos and, and can um, participate at, at your own pace and, and time. Uh, asynchronous is actually a tremendous disability accommodation um, because now you're no longer coupled to the, the pace that a, a class is being learning or delivered at. Uh, you can work when and, and, and where and how it, it's best for you. Um, Exams, you know, they're really polarizing topics. Some people are, are, are scared, but some people actually are really good test takers. Uh, and in when you're getting beyond high school, that can actually be a, a way to demonstrate what you're what you're competent in, what what you know. Uh, so there are many different programs where you can earn college credit through testing, uh, both in a, a technical college or a community or, or, or state college, but also in independent programs uh, from College Board or through like AP and, and CLEP and, and similar options. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of growth in programs known as transcripted credit or dual enrollment that allow you to, to get a taste of, of college level coursework in a high school environment. Um, these uh, are in a, in a high school, but you're actually um, either taking classes at a college or having them delivered in, in your high school environment and, and getting credit for, for both at the same time. Um, even if you're not looking to get a, a actual college degree, there's still a lot of valuable training out there um, from, from military, from workforce, uh, from professional associations, from employers, uh, that you can still combine these together to make a, a portfolio and demonstrate uh, who you are as what your capabilities are. Um, there's also a lot of non-college learning courses online. Uh, some of them give you some kind of certificate or, or, or credit or something. Um, 
And also there's in, uh, now innovative ways that, that uh, learning is being delivered uh, in something called competency-based education. That's a very different model that some colleges are starting to offer. Um, but the key lesson takeaway from the slide, look into these, combine them, make your own program. Uh, you can, colleges are, are increasingly good with, with transferring and transcripting credit. And so you can take your, your education with you as you move around to different institutions. Let's go to our next slide, please. So I'll, I'll start this, but I also want to get some, some input from my other panelists here. So talking about unexpected barriers in the post-high school transition, uh, the, the huge flip that I encountered uh, is that in high school, uh, it's the respon generally the responsibility of the school to seek out and identify students who are need have disabilities, need accommodations, uh, need support. Uh, but in when you get beyond high school, getting into the workplace, getting into a, a technical college or a community or, or, or state university, uh, it, you can still get many of the same accommodations, but it's now the responsibility of the student to identify themselves, to deliver documentation, get approvals, and make sure those accommodations are delivered. The trap that I, that I kind of fell on and I, I see people fall into is that they assume things work the same way that they did in, in high school. Uh, and they, they think that, hey, um, when I'm struggling, someone is going to reach out to me and, and find me and help me. Uh, and that's not really the way it, it works. It, it's now assumed that, that you're going to be the one that's doing that. Uh, Brooke and Blue, would you, and, uh, and also Christy, would you like to weigh in here? Yeah, one of the things that um, I came across is I think, especially if you seek out and use a lot of services for um, disabled people, um, that when you have certain kinds of disabilities, there's kind of assumptions about where you might want to or be able to go um, and being able to kind of articulate and, and advocate for like, like, hey, I know that it's probably going to be really, really hard for me to do this, but it's something that I do that I'm passionate about and I want to pursue um, can be really important. And like, if you, you know, that's something that you want um, to, to pursue and want these um, resources and support with to um, feel confident in going forward with that. Um, my um, the organizations I worked with um, back at 18 did not really know what to do with the fact that I wanted to become a psychologist, but I advocated for it and they made it work. And uh, 10 years later, I am not quite there, but I am in my equivalent of residency. I've got just a little under a year left to, to make that happen. And it was very difficult. Um, and I think it would have been easy to be dissuaded from it be, based on what people believe people can do, people like me can do. So I think being strong to those values and um, those goals um, can be really important. Um, I can, oh, oh, sorry, Christy, go ahead. Um, I can just speak quickly. So for me, when I went to UW-Whitewater and got my undergrad, um, I wasn't so concerned about the academics because um, that was kind of my strong area. What I was concerned about was navigating the personal care, um, finding personal care workers. Um, because before I went to Whitewater, my parents were doing all my caring. And so I had to navigate that hiring and um, working with personal care workers. And, but Whitewater was really good for that. Um, and I kind of found that what was difficult was after Whitewater. Um, Whitewater was kind of a utopia because everything was there. And then what to do after you're no longer at a great um, institution like Whitewater that, that you know, helps people navigate the personal care thing. Go ahead, uh, Blue. Um, I was going to say that um, one of the challenges I uh, encountered um, when I um, was was trying to do college was some of the the areas that my disabilities were um, challenging me and were not as clearly documented or didn't have clear um, answers for this is how we find accommodations or um, how we can make um, the uh, the program work for you, it wasn't set up. Um, uh, so there was a lot of things that I had to um, 
either ask a professor personally about and we had to talk about it and, and figure it out in person, um, which a lot of my professors, fortunately, were, were really great about, um, but they didn't know um, until I, I talked to them and, and um, let them know that I was having the issues um, that there was anything they needed to change. Um, but once, once I brought it up to them, um, uh, we were able to try to things change how I was, um, like getting my homework or, um, change when I had to, had to turn things in, um, uh, change how I was able to move about the college. Um, and also, um, there were times when I needed to have um, other people in my uh, support system help me in contacting um, various people at um, school or work. Um, and that's where it was really helpful to have um, uh, to to talk to um, my parents um, or or other students. Um, sometimes I didn't know how to ask what I for what I needed from a professor um so that was uh sometimes a, a challenge was knowing what to ask for so now we, we, we've heard of uh some, some struggles now let's uh move on to the next slide and talk about some some, some sources of support that we found uh personally I actually I was nervous about it at first, but I actually found a lot of support and encouragement in resources through student clubs and, and student organizations. Uh, I was kind of anxious about participating and, and taking on leadership roles and, and, and actions as a, as a person with disabilities, but I actually found that um, the, the communities there were, were very welcoming and inclusive and, and made some modifications to make things work for me and, and ensure that I had a, had a good time. Uh, and and those, uh, those student clubs and groups are actually the source of a lot of great enduring friendships, but also they open a uh, you know, career and, and other participation goals for me. So I'm, I'm very glad that I was able to participate in uh, several of those. Does anyone else on the panel want to? Yeah, so I think for me, um, something that was surprising in terms of getting support in terms of like work, any jobs that I worked, whether before I went to college or, or during um, grad school, um, I think early on I had um, tried really hard as, in interviews to not be not let people know about various disabilities, kind of masking very hard to um, appear as if I was a average typical person uh, worker to get hired, right? Um, and there's, you know, good reasons to do that when you're desperate. But later on, when um, I had more stability and more options, I started being like, I'm just going to be really open about this and be myself and, and explicitly talk about this in interviews. And I found um, one, it didn't limit my opportunities nearly as much as I should. I thought it would. Um, it opened a lot of doors for people who wanted disability advocacy, disability perspective in their um, companies, and then would then filter me into a job where I would not have to then spend the entire job worrying about trying to hide my disability or not get support. So just, I realized that being open about that straight up in the front end, like we're really kind of taught not to do that. Like, like oh, you should like hide it until you get hired and if you have no other option you have no other option but often being really upfront and honest about that helped me get a job that was a really good fit where there was a lot more support um and i don't think overall reduced um, my opportunities did we go right. to the next slide or does someone else have um anything they want to add Yep, let's go to the next slide and uh, talk about what, what self-advocacy uh, and, and what it looks like after high school. Uh, so as, as we touched on, the, the process of, of getting your needs met uh, really changes uh, after high school. Um, so what, when uh, people are, are in high school, I'd really encourage them to become the, the master of uh, their accommodations process, their, their needs. Um, that's when there's a, a good time to get increasing involvement in, in, in those processes and, and, and doing those things um, so that 
the transition and, and getting to that, that that next stage is very is easier when uh, they expect to be um, individually driven on, on those items. Um, high school is also the good time to, to get accommodations figured out of what you need, how do you, how is it delivered, how does it work, um, and, and get all the, the documentation and, and knowledge and, and, and mastery of all those related objects. Um, I know for me, um, like I said, Whitewater was pretty, like, I felt free, right? It was the first time that I wasn't the only person in a wheelchair with a disability, um, you know, driving my chair around the campus. And so I got to work with other folks with disabilities, various disabilities, just not physical disabilities, and see people. And so we would kind of um, come together and, like, problem solve different things that we experienced. Oh, I think for me, one of the biggest things about self-advocacy, especially in school, um, was telling people about what I might need before I needed it, because the point where I'm going to need accommodations is probably the point where I am stressed out and doing poorly um, for various reasons. So if I wait until then, it's much harder to have that conversation. Um, and it's easier if you can kind of prepare ahead and say like, hey, I don't know if this is going to come up but I know that this is usually something I need. This is usually something like um, around this time of year or with this type of task, I know that I really need this or I need that. And um, for, especially if you have things that, that can fluctuate like that or it's things where it's like, sometimes you can do it and it's gonna be fine, but occasionally there's gonna be a time where this is not just not gonna work for you. Um, being able to tell people up front um, can help a lot. Um, one of the things with self-advocacy that, that changed for me after high school um, was um, uh, when, when speaking up for myself um, and, and saying this is what I need or um, uh, this is who I am and I need you to understand that um, uh, when it came to uh, like professional situations and things like that. Um, uh, there was a different expectation, um, uh, like like JC was talking about um, uh, in in high school, um, uh, getting getting involved in the person who is um, representing yourself more fully, um, and after uh, um, uh, high school, um, in in medical areas and at, at um, like school areas um uh i was expected to um uh make decisions myself um uh that i like anticipated to um uh make a decision without without getting input from other other people in my life um because it was assumed oh you're you're an adult you make decisions or or sometimes um along those lines. And uh, something that I was reminded of um, when I would um, feel that I needed to do these things. And if it was a decision that um, I did want input on, and I was feeling badly for, for wanting um, some of that same support I'd had when I was younger, I was reminded um, by, by some people close to me that um, everybody, uh, needs input from other people at other times. And it's, it's just as, um, it's just as okay to, you know, go to a doctor's appointment by yourself as it is to bring somebody with you to help you be your own self-advocate. Um, or to like, if I sat down to write a letter to a wrestler, sometimes I would be fine to write it by myself. And sometimes I wanted to like, say, have a friend of mine look over what I had written and make sure that I was getting across what I wanted to say. Um, and it didn't mean that I was doing a better or worse job advocating for myself, um, whether I was literally by myself or not. Um, and, and knowing to ask for help when asking for help uh, is also a form of self-advocacy. Thanks, Lou. So let's get to the next slide to uh, share some key takeaways from this section. 
Uh, so uh, a very important lesson, uh, don't write off your, some, some post uh, high school options based on what happened in high school. Uh, there's many different ways to, to make things work and, and, and get them delivered. Um, many different styles and, and, and levels of, of, of learning and, and education. Um, so there, there's a lot of options for you to explore and try things out and, and, and see what works. Uh, another key point is there's a, a strong need for a realistic transition plan that, that everyone is all involved with and, and agrees to and, and has a part in. Uh, remember, milestones for, for adults uh, can, all, can all look different. Uh, everyone is on a different timeline, especially people who are LGBTQ plus or and or you know, have some disabilities. Uh, those are all going to impact uh, when things happen, how, how things get done. Um, it's very easy to fall into a trap of, of comparing yourself to certain peers and saying, hey, this person has already already graduated or this person has already done this program. You know, you're you're uh, you're you're running your own race. You're n you're not necessarily uh, in uh, uh, doing with what they're doing with. You're, you're your own person, and you have your own timelines. Yeah, we always talk in groups, but and it's a good reminder. But we are enough where we're at, and students are enough, people are enough. Like everyone has their own plan, and that can change. Let's get the next slide. So talking about uh, ways to get involved, uh, it, if you go to a, a, even a technical college or a community college or some other education program, uh, there's probably a lot of student organizations in that area. Um, but even if you, if you don't, uh, in your local community, at, uh, somewhere perhaps at, at your library, your community centers, your parks, uh, there are great ways to, to get involved and, and find people, find programs, find resources there. Um, if you do pursue education, uh, there are many different scholarships, programs, and, and other initiatives for students with disabilities that can help you get through your education program, uh, help you find employment, uh, help you advocate for yourself, seek those out both through uh, wherever you get education from, but also uh, independently. Um, but uh, one thing to remember, uh, after high school, a lot more independence and autonomy is, is expected. Um, they, they really expect, that if, and if you're in a college, that if you have an issue that you, uh, that you deal with that issue, that you can, that can manage those things. Um, so that's a good thing to really start, start practicing as part of this transition. Next slide. So now we're gonna be talking about community resources. So the questions will be, um, focused on that. So the first question is, what are some places, um, let's see, what are some places to start when finding community? Um, do you mind if I start first, y'all? So Go for um, it. when I moved to Milwaukee 17 years ago, um, again, I needed care. I needed to find that because if I didn't have that, then I couldn't get up or go to work or, you know, actually participate in my community. But what I realized when I went to providers is they only kind of validated half of my person, just the disability portion. And I'd be like, well, I'm LGBT. Oh, well, we don't really work with people like you. And I'm like, oh, there's not that many people. And like I said at the beginning of the um, our talk, 40% of people that identify as disabled have disabilities and are LGBT. Um, so that's what I always say. But I actually, this group that we're all a part of um, was created because it was a gap in services that I noticed when I started working. Well, so even before I started working at the center, and another person that was also in a wheelchair came up to me. It was our, um, an introduction and there was a bunch of new staff and they were like, hey, do you work here or do you volunteer? And I'm like, no, I work here. They're like, have you ever thought of having an LGBT disability support group? And I was like, yes, yes, I, that's in plan. Um, so I basically took it upon myself to create the community that was missing and kind of have a springboard for all of us to communicate and share and have fun and sometimes, you know, talk about our struggles, but also laugh together and 
uh, you know, create a uh, safe space, which for LGBT folks right now, it's very hard. I don't, um, politically and stuff, I, um, there's just different laws and bills that are going through the state Senate. So, anyone else want to jump in? Uh, I would, um, uh, in, in finding community um, for, especially for um, people who have uh, different kinds of sensibilities and are LGBTQ, I've found that um, there's a lot of alternative places to find community. Um, uh, online spaces are um, often a good, a good place to check out. Um, um, maybe communicating with somebody um, uh, digitally over text is a good way to connect. Um, you might find um, a, a forum of people uh, who talk about a shared interest. You might be able to find um, uh, a local community using uh, social media and, and find out that there's a program in your area or maybe that there's people who are connected and don't live anywhere near either. Um, uh, but you can still start building a community that way, um, there's also um, uh, there's lots of options when it comes to things that aren't necessarily school. Um, um, we mentioned libraries, um, community theaters, and art um, locations are a good place to um, find people to make connections with, um, um, especially. Uh, local community theaters, a lot of times there's people who are very new to the activities. Um, uh, and so it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you've had experience or, or um, uh, done anything there before. Um, uh, there's be other people who are new to that too. Um, park centers, um, uh, even if you're not going to a college for any of the classes there, um, they often have um, either the clubs will host activities or they'll have centers where you can find um, services at UD Waukesha, which is where I went for a very short period of time. Um, they had a, a resource center for LGBTQ people. Um, they had a um, uh, diversity uh, uh, center. Um, they had a center for veterans. Um, and these open to people who weren't part of the college, um, but uh uh wanted to come and get this information anyway or find people who had things in common with them or learn about people who didn't have things in common with them and they just needed to know more um so those are some good places to start uh J jc or um brooke do you have anything you want to add nope Okay. Next slide then. Um, so the next question is, what can you look for when you need financial support from your community? Who wants to take that? So there are um, a lot of programs and resources out there and they are also often pretty scattered and hard to find. Um, and um, what I would just like start with is some ideas to let you know some stuff that, that um, some categories of things that there tends to be funding for to try and look for what's in your area. So the um, first thing is um, there is scholarships, um, but there's also grants, which are a little different um, and looking at um, grants for disability and disability education, especially. So the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation works with um, individuals with disabilities on employment, but that employment can include um, higher education, if that's part of your career goal, because my career goal was to become a psychologist. Um, and they said, okay, <laughs> well, 10 years we're here with for you uh, with that. Um, and so because to be to get to that, that job, that was my goal, um, there was funding, some funding for the education piece. Um, so that, that is, I think, one option that's out there to explore if that's the path you want to go. Um, something else that can be um, a big category of expense and place to find an assistance is um, healthcare. 
Um, if you get healthcare um, at a hospital, if you get healthcare, if you get healthcare anywhere, you should look into their financial assistance and sliding scale fee policies. But especially at larger hospitals, um, they almost always have something that's called either financial assistance or charity care, which will often. Um, depending on your income, could make your care completely free, even if you don't have insurance or you do have insurance, but it has a really high deductible or something else, anything you can't afford. Um, it's just, you have to kind of look out for it and seek it out and apply for yourself. Um, so it's a lot of doing that research, just kind of like searching online or calling and asking about those like specific terms about financial assistance and charity care. Um, especially like if you have either doctor's appointments or if you have a bill from an ER visit, often they will apply um, retroactively. So if you have a big emergency and then you, you've got this big bill, you can often apply and it'll go back a certain number of months. And so it may get rid of your bill. So always look into that before um, um, having to kind of dig into your savings or just not, not being able to afford a bill, make sure that's something you look for. And something I would like to add to, to Brooke's excellent points is don't disqualify yourself. Um, I waited too long to apply to, to many of the programs that, that Brooke brought up uh, because I thought, well, that, that wasn't for me or um, you know, I'm not the person that, that they're really you know, trying to, to get to. When really that, that wasn't necessarily the case. And you know, I and my family took on a lot of other expenses and burdens that sometimes we, we didn't need to. Um, so yes, if, you know, if, if you qualify for the program, uh, go, out, go out and explore it and, and, and apply for it. Yeah, and that's a really good point because um, that was also an issue for me because I applied for SSDI and was denied. And I didn't realize for a long time that pretty much every other program on the planet has much less restrictive definitions of disability. Like if you've applied for disability SSDI and gotten denied and went, okay, I guess I'm not disabled enough. That's not, that's not true at all. Um, and that there are many other organizations that will recognize like, yes, you don't qualify for this specific government program, but you have a disability and you need support. So don't use that definition to restrict yourself. Just apply. They, get to, they can decide um, whether this is the right program or if they have referrals somewhere else. Um, so yeah, really great point, JC. Are we ready for the next slide? Yep. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. So the next question is how do you define your own successes after high school? Um, and I'm gonna mention something really quick and then I'll let my other panelists um, weigh in. But something that JC mentioned at the beginning was six, like, but success can be different for different people. There's not a timeline that says, oh, this is successful. I need to do this because this is how JC got successful. And this is the only measure of success. We are enough um, as disabled LGBT folks. Um, and successes can look different and will look different um, for different people. Um, and, I, and I think part of, sorry, go ahead, Blue. Oh, you can go ahead, Deborah, actually. Okay. Um, well, yeah, and part of it, I think, is um, deciding what matters to you and understanding what like matters to you as a person versus kind of what only matters because it's what's expected um, or you've never seen a different way to do things. So for me, um, I have never learned to drive. I'm not capable of driving. I think it would be a very bad idea for anybody on the road if I were to drive, given kind of everything I've got going on. Um, and um, that is something that we are often told, like to be an adult, you have to learn how to drive. Um, and that's not true. Um, it can make things harder if you don't, but there's also ways to um, work around it, whether there's public transport or anything else you might figure out. So like for me, my partner drives me everywhere um, and I bought them a car, right? That's how, that was our kind of trading of like, they were not able to um, purchase a car, um, I, but I could do that. And they were not able to drive, they were able to drive and I couldn't drive. So we're able to kind of accommodate each other's difficulties and work with each other as a community. Um, another thing for us is um, I, um, we've been together for 12 years, but we are not married because for us, um, 
kind of growing up at the time where we did before um, same-sex marriage was legalized, it was something that wasn't, it, we kind of decided it wasn't important to us. Um, and then a couple of years later, they're like, actually nationwide legalized. <laughs> um, so it's sort of a thing that's like, okay, that would be nice to do someday, but it's not like something that I value or is important to me kind of culturally or spiritually. So I don't feel like I need to have that. I need to make that happen. And my relationship needs to look like that, um, especially in the context of um, uh, my partner who's also disabled being on Medicaid and how marriage would interact with that. So like our relationship looks different, but that doesn't make it less of a, a milestone um, than anyone else's kind of relationship that maybe is, is arranged differently where people did get married at this point or, or didn't. Uh, for me, um, when I, um, as I was growing up in my, in my um, teens and, and, and like um, uh, a little bit before my teens, I had really, really wanted to go to college. It was a big dream of mine. Um, I, uh, my, my disability impacted me, but they impacted me differently. Um, and um, so when I uh, first started attending college, I was able to attend for a couple months. Um, and then um, uh, my disabilities changed. And um, uh, I had to withdraw from college, I had to um, quit work and everything. And I had to, I had already been working with the uh, of um ideas in some ways with disability but at that time I had to change my idea of success from a lot um uh once I I found out that um uh some of the things I was dealing with would make it change so I attending college the way I had wanted to was not really anything that's feasible for me. And I had to decide, okay, well, what, what did I actually want with that? And what would make me happy? What is it that I did still want with that? Um, and um, I had to change a lot of what I had expected um, because there were things that I was, um, uh, that successes that, I was basing on, um, oh, this is a thing that many people um, in in the country do, and that's considered successful. Oh, going to college, that's considered successful. Um, and, you know, you don't have to match up with that. And I also had to change the things that I had wanted to do for me that I had considered, oh, I, I personally want to go to college. I think that would be great. And I had to change that. And um, so I have found ways to use my strengths um to um uh be part of groups that are that are smaller um be part of groups um digitally on online um i uh i had to um make a lot of adjustments in what i was doing um and it was it was hard to do that. Um, uh, and, but one of the things that I, I found was once I, once I did make the change of, of how I viewed successes and it's kind of a work in progress because my disabilities keep changing. Um, I'm able to be really happy with what, um, what I, achieve or how I'm living and just it's it's not like oh I'm looking for this specific goal in my life it's like I'm I'm good with what's going on right now um uh and I don't need to be like okay I need to reach this point at the end of a few months from now it's like right now I'm doing things that make me happy and they um connect me with people around me and that's successful for me Um, did anybody else have any other point for that? I think we're, are we, we're good to go to the next slide. Yep. Okay. Um, how do you navigate friendships as you transition to adulthood? 
Uh, one thing I found here, uh, at first I was very nervous uh, and, and didn't really know how to react when, after I got out of high school, everyone that I, that I knew and interacted with in high school all scattered and went their own directions. Uh, and and I felt all of a sudden a lot of the, the support networks and, and people that I'd like to hang out with and do things with, they're, they're now all in different places doing different things. Uh, and I, I really struggled to rebuild that. Um, but where rebuilding that came from was being involved in the community, being involved in education and, and clubs and organizations. Uh, and, you know, you're, that's going to be a big transition coming out of high school with your friend groups, but uh, you'll, you'll make new ones. And that's a, that's a very important skill to practice. Anyone else have anything they want to add to this one? Um, I think just thinking about like um, how important it is to kind of communicate your needs, like that's something that you have to do um, throughout your life, but especially into um, adulthood when you have less of that kind of built in support kind of being upfront with your friends about what you need um, and that like, hey, I can't do an event that's like three hours long walking in the heat or, but I'd like to do this with you. Um, and um, making sure that um, you don't just kind of try and hide all that and push through because if they are your friends, they would want to know and trying to work out um, something that everyone can do and enjoy is a, it's a skill. It takes a lot of practice, but the sooner you can kind of be open about it and um, practice doing that, the more you're gonna have success and, and, and good strong friendships. Awesome. Thanks, Brooke. And I just want to let everybody know that it's 1140 um, as far as timing goes. Thanks. Um, one last thing for, for this slide is that um, uh, if you've been attending like public school or something, um, and as you become um, an adult, one of the relationships is not interacting with uh, people in the same uh, frequency. So you might not see somebody as often. Um, and that's something to, to practice um, or just be aware of. Um, uh, you might need to um, get in contact with people on your own, initiate things, or to be aware that you might not hear somebody for a longer time. And that can be an engine in relationship to be, oh, really mean that the relationship is getting worse or anything, but it may be different. Thanks, Blue. Mm -hmm. Next slide. How and when do you start taking on managing adult responsibilities? Casey, do you have anything you want to add to this? Yeah, um, so there, there's a the wide range of things that can be considered adult responsibilities uh, from from banking to dealing with, with government agencies um, to um, maintaining a, a household. Um, these are all things that, you know, legally, um, when you turn 18, you're, you're kind of expected to do, of course. I mean, many other people, it's it, uh, not quite ready to do that, um, but how and when to do that, start learning, start start talking to, uh, to, to parents and guardians about, hey, how does this work? Uh, get involved in in looking at looking at finances, looking at how things work, uh, so that you're, you're, you're ready to, to take that on, um, you know, at the right time. And again, just being open about um, your needs and, and um being able to ask for help and, and knowledge, just saying if there's something you've never done before, often whether it's opening a bank account or writing a check or something, just letting the person know like, hey, I've never done this before. Could you walk me through step by step um, or just just give me the steps for it? Like a lot of people are actually very willing to do that. Um, they just they're going to assume, you know, but if you tell them, hey, I don't know how to do this and can you help me? Um, you may find you get a lot more just support and help and then you don't have to struggle on your own. Um, and it's also never, oh, sorry, Christy. No worries. Sometimes it's hard to navigate the systems. Uh, the system is a very confusing web, and I think it, in some regards, they want it to be that way so people don't challenge it or fight it or reach out and, you know, um, so that things need to be changed. But 
that can be done too. And you don't have to do that alone. You can reach out to advocates, um, support systems. I do that all the time. So, go ahead, Blue. It's also um, never too late to take on um, a responsibility or learn how to. Um, there's tons of books that, that people check out from libraries all the time. There's classes. Um, people who are senior citizens are still learning skills, um, like home economic skills of how to do laundry, um, because everybody learns these different skills at uh, different points in time. So if you're needing to, to practice an adult responsibility and you haven't gotten it yet, you can still learn that. Great. Next slide. Um, so these are the takeaways. Most of you in the room have this. I, I think to be aware of time and just to make sure that we get to the questions, we're going to skip over these if that's okay. Um, but like I said, you have access to um, the written, uh, the slides and online as well. So. Um, getting what you need from your health care provider. Health care can be a scary thing. And talking to your health care provider, especially if you're LGBTQ plus and have a disability, that can add a lots of layers. Um, we end up talking about um, dealing with health care providers and the struggles and the frustrations that come with it a lot in groups. So uh, we can um, continue with it. Um, so the first question is, what are some important questions to ask your doctor? Do you mind if I take this one, y'all? Yep. So um, when I first came to Milwaukee, I was kind of more shy, and I, I you know, I, I'm from Illinois originally, so, and I thought that, oh, I'm on the system. I just kind of got to take what I can get. Uh, and what I realized um, is that I have the power. So when, before I go to doctors, I kind of interview them and talk to them. And if it doesn't feel right, not that like sometimes there might be some things that I don't want to hear that I need to do for myself. I'm not talking about that. But if you don't have a connection with your doctor, if they don't seem to see both parts of who you are, meaning LGBT and disability or maybe race and disability or whatnot, then go to another doctor. Find someone that you connect with because you're going to be coming to them with some good things, some bad things. They're in there for the long haul, but they're there to support you. And if they don't, get, get out and find another one. Yeah, those are, those are very important points to, to know your rights as a, as a patient and as a person. Um, know what you can do because, you know, sometimes you're going to get routed to a, a, a provider that is just, it's not working. Uh, but yes, you, you can change that. Um, you can you know, take, be in charge of those decisions, uh, you know, and also ask for help. Uh, you can ask uh, people to, or, or friends or, or relatives to help advocate for yourself. Um, you can ask your medical providers to explain things in different ways or, or provide you uh, with, with, with written or some other type of uh, in information that, that you can understand better. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you can, uh, ask them to adjust how your care is delivered to make sure it works for you as a person. Anyone else? Are we ready for the next one? Next slide. Yeah. Next slide's fine, thanks. Um, so, uh -oh. um, what common conditions should people with developmental disabilities be aware of? I'll start. So, you know, in addition to um, the disability related conditions, you can also get normal people issues and it can, it can kind of be hard to, to debug that sometimes of, okay, what, what's going on with me? Um, of course, there's all the, the still uh, developmental milestones that are happening uh, and, and processes that are happening as well. Um, but one thing I, I really want to highlight is mental and emotional health care. Dealing with, with disabilities and also LGBTQ plus uh, identity, those can be very emotionally straining. Um, 
so don't forget to, to look after that part of, of yourself. For sure. Yeah, and so some of the things that, I mean, anything, um, you, you can have any sort of kind of health stuff going on, but some of the stuff that tends to be more common in developmental disabilities um, is, um, so migraines is one, um, and that can look different. So you maybe classically, you think like, oh, I need to have a specific like stabbing pain here and I need to be seeing things and that's what a migraine is. And for some people it looks like that, for some people it doesn't. If you're having a regular kind of headache um, and it's it's impacting your life and, and if you've got anything associated with that, it's good to talk to the doctor about because that can come up pretty frequently um, if you have a developmental disability. Um, having um, hypermobility, so if you're, where your joints stretch a little farther than they should, um, so if you're able to like touch your thumb to your wrist and, um, or stuff like that, um, those can be, um, again, more common and can um, result in some issues with pain and other things, so that can be good to talk to a doctor, a physical therapist about um, vision issues can also be common, especially a like um, eye drift. Um, so that's, I, I have that. So I have this little prism on my glasses. I don't know if you can see, but um, if you start to get a little bit of double vision when you're tired or something like that, that's again, something else to talk to your doctor about. Just like little things that we may not necessarily notice or think like, oh, this is just kind of day-to-day -day life, but which are again, more common if you have a developmental disability and there is kind of treatment and stuff to, to check out for that. Thanks, Brooke. Next slide is good. <clears throat> um, how is interacting with adult healthcare providers different compared to child-focused providers? Uh, so an important lesson I've, I've learned here is that um, adult-focused and child-focused providers see and are, are used to different uh, conditions and, and the development of those conditions. Um, you know, child-focused providers are, are very often very familiar with developmental disabilities and what's related to them. Um, but once you get into the adult health healthcare providers, um, they're often seeing conditions that happen as a result of, of, of aging or, or other factors. Uh, so there's often a need to, for more uh, background information. Sometimes you actually end up uh, educating your, your healthcare provider a bit, which sometimes it, it feels wrong, but sometimes uh, they're, they're just not used to the way uh, some, something happened with you. Um, but just keep that in mind that you, the, the orientation and, and background of, of your providers tends to change a bit when you get into the adult system. Anyone else? Um, just similar to what uh, we talked about with um, addition, um, sometimes what you need in healthcare, uh, the direction just so often when you're a, a child, the doctor or um, your parents or guardians um, will be uh, sort of directing, like keeping track of, oh, I need to get a flu vaccine or, oh, I need to get my eyes checked um, and kind of um, noticing if there's, if there's a problem and, and helping from the outside. Um, whereas with um, adult focused doctors, um, a lot of times uh, you kind of, it is helpful to um, kind of do what you can to take stock of what's going on in your body and bring the issues to a doctor um, or to someone to help you to bring it to a doctor um, because it is more self-directed um, oftentimes when it's an adult focused healthcare provider um, than with a child focused healthcare provider. Next slide. Um, how do you know what kind of health care you need and how to access it? So something I found very helpful here is the resources provided by um, you know, health insurance, whether that's a, a public or a private plan. Uh, they will often provide a, a 24 hour nurse line service. Uh, this is something that I've turned to many times when I, I get some new or unexpected or strange issue and I don't know what where to go or what to do about it. Um, 
these services are really there to help you navigate the healthcare system and say, hey, or this is something that's emerging, you need to go to an ER right now, or you can go to, you can go to an urgent care, or this is something to just send a message to your, your doctor about and try to get a regular follow-up appointment. Those, those nurse line services have been very impactful for me. Um, your, your insurance provider may have them, but they're also sometimes available uh, through your healthcare provider and your, your healthcare system. So that definitely look into those. Awesome. Can I have a time check? 11.54. Okay. Thanks. Um, the other thing is just making sure to um, I really have a good relationship with a, a general practitioner, so a GP or a, something called a PCP, primary care provider, um, who you really, you really kind of really trust and communicate well with because they can be your center for referrals to everywhere else and helping you figure out like, who do I need to go to for this? Um, and making sure that like, if you have come a couple of like, say little things that you're like, I don't really need, I don't really need or want a whole doctor's appointment for that. But if you have a couple of little things and you're, you're building up for me, it's like, if I've got like three things that I wouldn't go for an appointment myself, but if I've got three of these things, I should go and talk to it. Maybe it's just like my allergies are a little worse and I have a little bit of a skin condition. It's not bothering me, but it's still kind of an issue. And then I have one other thing. I should just go and make an appointment to talk through all that so we can know where I would need to go, especially if it gets worse, um, because there can be wait lists and catching things early. So making sure that you don't just like kind of let those things go either, because your general practitioner can help you figure out what kind of health care you need for that. Next slide. Um, and then, like I said before, you all can read the takeaways or look it up afterwards. For this section. Um, and then healthy relationships and sexuality. So everybody on the panel, I think I'm gonna show the video. We can talk a little bit and then we'll go to questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. You can feel it when your dream becomes a pursuit. And with vitiligo. Great. Bigger. So I'll. Where, where is it? Usually it shows up. That's the F key. Thank you. See you at seven. Hey, Alex, was that about Young Inventors Club? Tonight I'm unveiling my latest creation, the Pizza Taco. It's gonna be incredible. Oh, sorry, I was gonna tell you. I can't make it tonight. I'm actually going mini-golfing with Jillian Peters. Jillian Peters? Student body president? First chair clarinet and stage band? Fifth level warlock on our ongoing medieval role-playing campaign? She is so cool! I didn't even know you were into that. Medieval role-playing games? No, like, you know, dating. I mean, I hope it's okay to ask, but can your parts do stuff? Actually, my parts work just fine. Just because I'm in a wheelchair, it doesn't mean I don't have crushes or feel attracted to people. In fact, no matter what our bodies can or can't do physically, people with disabilities have the same sexual and romantic feelings as anyone else. And, like anyone else, people with disabilities have various sexual orientations and gender identities too. From heterosexual to gay, cisgender to trans, across a full spectrum of sexuality. But are relationships more difficult for people with disabilities? Well, regardless of my physical ability, I want the same things from a healthy relationship as everyone. Respect, communication, consent, and fun. And, like everyone, I sometimes have questions about relationships. Like, how do I know if someone's interested in me? How do I ask someone out? Or, how do I turn someone down if I'm not interested? Putting yourself out there and trying to date can make anyone feel nervous or scared. But the more you educate and understand yourself and your own value, the better you'll get at feeling confident and making healthy decisions. There are certain issues that people with disabilities could be more likely to face. Sometimes it can feel like parents are overprotective when it comes to dating. Or friends might not think of us in a romantic way because they don't understand that we have the same kinds of feelings. And there are some specific challenges that a person with disabilities might have to deal with. For example, if you had trouble communicating verbally, you'd have to find ways other than speech to express yourself or give consent like using body language, adaptive devices, or pictures. Think of it this way. Everyone's body is different and needs help from time to time. 
And regardless of a person's physical ability, they can have the same feelings, hopes, and dreams as anyone. Thanks, guys. I think I get it now. Sorry I didn't understand before, Alex. It's okay. And you know what? I've got something that's gonna make your date with Jillian even more awesome. One New York-style soft-shell pepperoni and one hard-shell deep-dish bean blaster. Thanks, but were those in your pockets? Just since this morning. Ew. Um, so I think I'm gonna just kind of reiterate. Um, a lot of times I've talked to people and um, done many talks and communicated with folks and people like, well, but people with disabilities aren't sexual. We, and I always say, yeah, we are. We're people. Um, and I mean, people may need to express it differently or use different tools or things ad ad like adaptations. But um, just because you do things differently does not mean that you don't have needs, desires, or wants. Um, so um, does anyone want to add something really quick? Like, and then we'll um, leave time for Q&A. Uh, so I, I want to add uh, that I, I often, initially, when I was uh, getting into the dating and relationships, I'd often feel that I, I needed to, to hide uh, my disabilities or um, work harder in the relationship, uh, put in more effort or, or, or sacrifice myself just just to make things even. And that's that's not a healthy way. That's that's a sign that, that something is not going right. Uh, when you're in, in a, a positive, healthy relationship, um, there, there is a, a give and take. Your partner will acknowledge your needs and, and, and make space and, and, and work to, to make it work uh, so that you, you shouldn't have to be you know, doing something that, that's harmful to yourself just, just to try and, and get into a relationship. Thanks, Stacey. Anyone else? Okay, so now comes the fun part. Um, I hope you learned something in the session, but feel free to ask us any questions that you have. Now it's, it's your time, and no question is a dumb question or a question like I. Before I worked in this field, I was a teacher, so uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. We're here to share and answer any questions you have. Yes. Do you all mind if I take this one? Okay. We, we couldn't hear it, so you'd have to repeat it to us anyways. Um, if you could just let us know, like, the basic, what you're answering. Okay. So the question was, and uh, if I misrepresent, just let me know. So if um, a child or a person with a disability realizes after, um, that after like, they become an adult that their sex assigned at birth does not match, um, how they feel, um, and that they might be transgender or somewhere on the LGBT spectrum. How do you, how do you handle it? How, how do you um, tell your parents or tell people that care about you? Um, so what we always say at the center when I do presentations like this is the person has to feel safe. And depending on um, the like the views of the parent or the guardian, um, they might not feel safe to tell like 
the mom or the dad or the guardian, but they might tell a teacher or tell someone that they trust. And um, basically, the person needs to feel safe. I always tell people if they want to come out and they don't feel safe talking to a person, then don't. Um, talk to people that you first trust and, and then maybe help that person that you trust kind of um, explain or kind of be a buffer or a support system to go and talk to the people that might be a little bit more difficult or have a little more difficulty understanding. I'd like to add that identity is, is a very uh, evolving process. Uh, I see myself, I describe myself, I have an image of myself now that is, is different than it was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm constantly learning new things about myself, um, what, I, what I like, what I don't like. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I've, I've had points when I, I had this, this image or this, this notion of myself and I, I, I came across something that, that made me, that made me challenge that or, or question that. Um, and that, that can be hard to, when, when there is that kind of conflict. Um, but I, identity doesn't have to be fixed. It, it, it can be something that, that shifts or changes or, or, or evolves through time. Great question. Anyone else? Yes. So I'm going to point to Brooke. Brooke mentioned this earlier um, in their discussion, but um, this is something that's very important to me. So my partner, Alex, is in the room. Uh, well, but you can see him. He's waving. Um, we've been together for 15 years. But if, if we were to get married, I, I would lose my personal care. I would lose my insurance. And there's no other insurance besides state insurance that covers personal care. Um, I work a full-time job, so I could get off and whatnot, but there's no other insurance that I could get on that would cover personal care. Um, so, But I'm not afraid to say that anymore and share because I feel when you share about it, that's when change is made. Um, when marriage equality passed, in June of, of 2015, thanks Alex, um, I was in Milwaukee at Pride Fest and I was excited, but I also was sad and pissed off if I'm being quite frank with y'all because only half of myself was being celebrated. The other half was like, okay, so your LGBT part of you can get married, but the, dis the, the disabled part of Christy cannot. And it was quite sickening if I'm being truthful. So does anyone else want to add anything? I mean, I know, I mean, part of that is because it sounds like we just got in the chat part of it is like, how do we fight for that right? And I think a lot of the, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways forward. But the one that I think personally makes the most sense is a lot of the Medicaid for all um, pushes, because if everyone is on an insurance that covers this because and it's not related to income, then that would result in um, disabled people getting access to this right. So it's, it's one of those, I guess, kind of curb cup things where if we 
I guess in the reverse, where if we got this for everybody, um, then that would resolve a lot of the issues where this is like, you have to be in a very specific situation. And if you're not exactly this, even though it's going to be devastating to you to lose this, then like, you don't get this. If everyone had that support and everyone had access to that, um, then we wouldn't keep having to have that these, these tests of like, oh, do you have, do you have, do you make enough, um, do you make this or that, or do you, qualify for this or qualify for that because that's where a lot of the barriers come from. So I think um, that's that's one way forward, although there's lots of others. Also, there is on Facebook, um, I know Facebook is not for the young folks. I guess I'm not young anymore, but uh, Facebook has a group that's called Marriage Equality for People with Disabilities. Um, and it was started by a trans individual. I believe he's from Ohio. Um, so check that out. Um, I don't know, make noise on Twitter or um, uh, TikTok or whatnot, because people need to know. Um, they need to have conversations like this because a lot of like our allies or straight folks don't e even know this. So by you all being here, it's the first step of many, because so, we need allies. Great question, and thanks for asking. Anybody else? Well, thank you all. Um, I believe are the um, evaluations, have they been passed out yet? So our great room monitor is passing out evaluations as we speak. Um, please be upfront and honest and let us know how we did so um that we uh can probably come back next year and share more information with you thank you all so much thank you all